turn with me, if you will, to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 23. First Samuel chapter 23. As we continue in this series on lessons from the wilderness, I want to look at a, a message today entitled Wilderness Growth. As we've learned, the wilderness isn't just a a barren place. It's also a divine classroom where God teaches us some of life's most important lessons. Today, we'll look at the life of David during some of the wilderness experiences that he had to understand a few crucial aspects that lead to growth while in the wilderness. Remember back to to our our first uh, message in this series, I don't want us to focus on the fact that we're in the wilderness. Yes, we acknowledge it, we understand that it's difficult and it's trying and, and all of those things, but what we focus on not only determines our reality, but becomes larger in our life And so today I want to look at that component of growth that can happen in the wilderness because these moments are not meant to break us, but to build us and shape us into the people that God called us to be. Throughout David's life, there are plenty of highs and lows. And in 1 Samuel chapter 23, we find David in a season of intense trial and pursuit He's already been anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel, yet he finds himself in a precarious position. Despite his faithful service to King Saul and his victory over Goliath, David has now become the target of Saul's relentless jealousy and murderous intent. Forced to flee for his life, David takes refuge in the wilderness And this period is not merely a a backdrop for survival for David, but it's a critical juncture in David's spiritual journey where God refines his character and his faith. The wilderness, and for David specifically, the harsh terrains of Maon and the caves of Engedi become David's temporary home. It's here, away from the comforts and security of his former life, that David faces the true test of his faith. Stripped of most of his earthly support, David's reliance on God intensifies during this time. This backdrop of danger and divine intervention sets the stage for powerful lessons of growth that emerge from David's wilderness experience. Through these trials, David's heart is molded His relationship with God is deepened and it prepares him for the kingly destiny that lies ahead. The trials and tests that David endures during this time would strengthen his character and refine the heart that God had given him years ago when he was still a shepherd boy in his father's house. Without this wilderness time, David would not have been the king that he needed to be. It was crucial for him to go through these times And it was during this period of David's life that the isolation of being a shepherd boy became forged into a reliance on God and his leading. It was in the caves of En Gedi that David's true character is tested and revealed, proving that he was not only to be the next king of Israel, but that he was a man of integrity that could be trusted to do the right thing in the eyes of God. Yes, David, like most of our heroes of the faith, was flawed and imperfect. But he had a heart after God, and part of it we'll dig into today. So let's begin with the first lesson in growth that we see from David's experience here in the wilderness. And that first lesson is separation. In 1 Samuel 23, David is being pursued by Saul. Once the servant of the king, he now finds himself running from the man he had been so faithful to. David had become close to Saul, but is now on the run. So let's pick up this story in verse 26 through 28 
of chapter 23. Saul was going along one side of the mountain and David and his men were on the other side, hurrying to get away from Saul. If someone was after me to kill me, I would hurry as well. (laughs) As Saul and his forces were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, come quickly, the Philistines are raiding the land. Then Saul broke off his pursuit of David and went to meet the Philistines. That is why they call this place Selah Hamach Lekath. Easy for me to say. In English, it means the rock of parting. Here, David finds himself in the wilderness of Moan, pursued by King Saul. But God in his divine providence causes Saul to turn away at a critical moment, allowing David to escape. This act of separation is symbolic because in this moment, David and Saul were truly separated. They would never reconcile again. There have been moments of ups and downs and they'd get close again in the future, but they'd never fully reconcile. So the same is true in our lives. The wilderness separates us from the world and our past life, stripping away the distractions and dependencies that hinder our walk with God. In the wilderness, God calls us to a place of deeper consecration. It's a time to detach from worldly influences and focus on our relationship with him. Just as David was set apart for a purpose, we too are called to be sanctified. We're called to be set apart for a holy purpose that is dedicated to God. Separation during the wilderness facilitates a transformation where we learn to rely solely on God's provision and his guidance. It's here that we develop a great sensitivity to his voice for our lives. All the other distractions are gone and we can focus on him. This concentrated time of reliance on God and separation from the world allowed David to deepen his sensitivity to God's voice during this time. And in doing so, he exemplifies the second lesson for growth, and that's faithfulness. So the first part to grow, we need to be separated. And the second part is to be faithful. Take a look with with me, if you will, at chapter 24. Verse 1 through 7 of 1 Samuel. It continues the story of David and Saul, and it says, After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of Engedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. I think most of you are familiar with the rest of that story. David then has a a conversation with Saul and says, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And, And you really should stop trying to kill me. But one of the things that I've always wondered about was how in the world did David get close enough to the man to cut off a corner of his robe without Saul realizing it? I think I might've figured out why. We've talked a couple of times about the deserts of Maon, the, the caves of Engedi, the desert region in that area we're talking about is west of the Dead Sea in Israel. It is a very barren place. In fact, if you'll put the first picture up, this is pretty much, much what most of it looks like. It's dry, it's rocky, there's not much there. 
this was the area that David willingly ran to to get away from Saul. And it's a pretty good idea. There's not much there. There's not really any people there. It can't really support life. He was hiding pretty well, but clearly somebody figured out where he was. So then it says he went to the caves of Engedi. And Engedi is a, a very a critical place in scripture. But I found out why. If, if you look back in, uh, in that passage that we just read, it says that Saul went to look for him near the crags of the wild goats. I'm like, what, is, what does that mean? Well, apparently in Engedi, in that area, those sheer cliffs on the side were home to goats. And there were lots of them, but they were in Engedi because of this picture. Engedi is an oasis in the middle of the desert. The Dead Sea is near there, but it's below sea level. It's so salty that you can float in it without any effort. You can't drink the water. It doesn't help produce life, but in Getty does. So David ran to the one place where he could find shelter and life when he ran from Saul. And the big waterfall, so this is a, a picture of modern day in Getty. You can go and take tours of it. My guess is that waterfall is why Saul didn't hear David sneaking up on him. But David, even though he had the opportunity, doesn't take Saul's life. He's being prodded by his men and he still doesn't take his life. After Saul entered in, unaware of his presence, and as David's men are, are trying to get him to kill Saul, he refuses saying, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. Despite being in the wilderness, despite fleeing from his life, and despite this being the 15th time that Saul has tried to kill David, David still remains faithful to God and respects the authority of the anointed king that God had put over him. Respecting the anointing of God in this moment would allow David to reap similar benefits during his reign as king. And this faithful in the wilderness for us is crucial because it's easy to lose heart and take matters into our own hands when we're in difficult situations. David's example teaches us to remain steadfast and trust in God's timing and sovereignty. Faithfulness means staying true to God's commands and honoring those he has placed in authority, even when it's challenging. In the wilderness, our character is tested, and it's through these tests that our faithfulness to God is proven. There is a tendency when going through the wilderness to shortcut the process. And we see that a lot throughout Scripture. Abraham tried to fulfill the promise with Sarah's handmaiden. Moses kills the Egyptian. Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier that's that there to take Jesus. There are plenty of examples where things were done at the wrong time or in the wrong way. But here in David is an example of the right way because David remains faithful to God even though David had been anointed the next king. He could have reasoned that since he had already been anointed, that he could take what was rightfully his and overthrow the existing king. But God hadn't removed Saul yet. Even though in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, verse 14 says that God announced that Saul's kingdom would not endure and that another had been anointed to take his place. So Saul has already been told, that's it, you're done. Your line will end with you. David could have reasoned well, he's, he's gonna be out, I've been anointed, I'll just take my place. But it wasn't his time to be king yet. It was David's time to learn and grow so that he could become the man worthy of the anointing he had received. It would have been wrong for David to usurp the throne at that time because even the right thing done at the wrong time is still wrong. Let that one sink in. Even the right thing done at the wrong time is still wrong. 
Trusting in God's timing is paramount. We must remain faithful to God in order to properly fulfill the plans and purposes that he has for our lives. So finally, let's look at the third lesson of growth from David's example in the wilderness. And that third lesson is worship. At this point, David has been separated from his old life. He's been tested and found faithful to God. And the next phase is what our reasonable response should be in any season of life. David, while hiding in the cave from Saul, writes a psalm. If you've got a study Bible and you turn to Psalm 57, you may see a note at the top that says that it was written by David while in the cave hiding from Saul. So let's look at Psalm 57 for just a moment and the worship that poured out in the middle of being pursued by a man trying to kill David. Verse one of Psalm 57 starts by saying, Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me. For in you, I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. This first verse, David is acknowledging his reliance upon God. And that first component of worship that we find here is surrender. We must acknowledge that God is the one to whom we must take refuge in during times of trial. We may be tempted to go our own way and try to force our way through the storm, but it's really just beating against the wind. We need to stay close to God and find shelter in him. Just like a mother bird gathers her chicks or or her her babies to herself under her wings to, to cover them, so God covers us in the midst of trials. And he'll pull us close to himself so that the worst of the storm will pass over us. Now, one thing that helps is to be close to him before the storm starts. But even if you find yourself away from God in this moment and the storms are raging, it's not too late to run to him. His arms are still open. And just like the father in the story of the prodigal son, he's watching from afar off. And he'll welcome you in with open arms. Did you know in the story of the prodigal son that Jesus was taking a a modern parable from his day and twisting it just a little bit? That parable tracks almost the same way as what we have in scripture until the end. When the prodigal son returns, the parable in Israel at the time was that the father turned him away and said, no, you've already had your inheritance. You squandered it. Jesus took the wisdom of the day and turned it. And he said, no, my father's watching for you. And it doesn't matter if you've squandered your inheritance. It doesn't matter if you've run away from me. It doesn't matter what you've done. When you come to me, I'll run to you and I'll welcome you back in with open arms. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. The rest of Psalms 57, David goes on. And in verse seven, we'll pick up what he says. He says, my heart, oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul, awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens and let your glory be over all the earth. Despite the fear and uncertainty surrounding him while hiding in a cave from a man who was trying to kill him, David chooses to worship God. Worship in the wilderness is powerful. It shifts our focus from our circumstances to the greatness of our God. Worship is an act of faith, declaring that God is worthy of praise regardless of our situation. It's through worship that we find strength, peace, and the assurance of God's presence. David's psalm shows us that worship is not just for the mountaintop experiences, but also for the valleys and the wilderness moments. Worship is our declaration of trust in God 
and our weapon against despair. Worship is our declaration of trust in God and our weapon against despair. So as we reflect on these wilderness moments in David's life, be encouraged today. The wilderness is not a place of defeat, but a place of divine encounter and spiritual growth. Through separation, God calls us to deeper intimacy with him. We must set aside the things in our past, whatever they are, whether it's pride or selfishness or anger or hurt or bitterness or greed or, or lust or, or the, the great things that we've done, whatever it is, we have to set those aside and let God set us apart for a holy purpose. Through faithfulness, God molds our character and strengthens our resolve. When we submit to God and his authority over our lives, then he can begin to refine and use the traits that he has placed in us for our good and for his kingdom. Just like a sculptor chipping away the stone until the figure that he sees within is exposed, God will chip away the things in our lives that aren't pleasing to him. And although this is a painful process, the end result is a beautiful masterpiece. And through worship, the Lord reminds us of his greatness and fills us with his presence. The Holy Spirit dwells within each of us as believers and gives us what we need for the day. Strength, peace, boldness, power to be his witness, comfort. God has given us so much through his son's death on the cross and through his indwelling spirit, how can we do anything but worship him, whether we're on the mountaintop or in the wilderness? All three of these lessons are vital for growth. The separation, the faithfulness, worship. But these three things hinge on two main points. The first is to lean on the godly influences that he has placed in your life. When David was in the cave, his men told him to kill Saul. They quoted prophecy. Now, we're not told of that prophecy beforehand. So whether they made it up or it's just not recorded, we don't know. But thankfully, David didn't listen to them because he spared Saul's life. It's possible that they made it up, but... In either way, David listened to the Lord. And it's a good thing because that prophecy didn't come true. Saul dies on the battlefield, not by the hand of David. And instead of trusting the voices around you, trust the voices that God has placed in your life. Please realize that we were not created to live in isolation. You're not supposed to be an island unto yourself. Remember in Genesis that God said it was not good for man to live alone, so he created Eve for Adam. In Hebrews 10, we're told to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We were created to live in community and have a support system around us. And God provides the right people at the right time in our lives. Look at 1 Samuel 23 with me. Back up just a little bit. In verse 15, we see David listening to such a voice. While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. That's godly wisdom. Notice that Jonathan tells David to not be afraid. And it says he helped him find strength in the Lord. Godly wisdom will always urge you to lean on God and his wisdom, not your own thoughts and desires. Let me say that one more time. When we seek godly wisdom, his wisdom, will always urge you to lean on God and his wisdom, his ways, 
not your own thoughts and desires. The second hinge point is maybe even more crucial to growth in the wilderness. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, 4, and 12 all start basically the same way. Speaking of David, it says, He inquired of the Lord. Once again, David inquired of the Lord. And again, David asked. No less than three times in that one chapter, David goes to God and says, here's my choice. Here's my dilemma. What should I do? And he's exemplifying the the base of what we should do. Before he made a move, he prayed. He sought the Lord and he listened to his reply. And that's crucial. Don't, Don't skip past that. To not only pray, but to wait on the Lord for his reply. Everything that we do must be grounded and surrounded in prayer. In order to successfully navigate the wilderness, to learn the lessons from the wilderness, to survive the wilderness experiences, we must take everything to God in prayer. In each of those examples, David is crying out to God and the Lord replies to him and gives him the answer that he needs. In some cases, probably not the answer that he wanted, but it was the answer that he needed. In David, we see growth that is not only possible during the wilderness, but growth that God desires as the outcome of your wilderness experiences. David moves from being a somewhat impulsive young man to prayerfully decisive man. David's reliance on God and his worship to God only deepens during this time. He passes the test of faithfulness and reaps the rewards of that faithfulness during his time as king of Israel. David teaches us to worship, to pray, to lean on the godly influences in our lives, the ones who builds us up and pushes us closer to the king of kings. So today's lesson from the wilderness is to embrace the wilderness moments, to thank God for them because they shape us into the image of Christ and they produce spiritual growth and maturity in our lives. Today, let us turn our eyes upon Jesus and run our race with perseverance. Let us mount up with wings as eagle, run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Let us cry out to the maker of heaven who hears us and answers us in our time of need. Let us remain faithful and steadfast no matter the circumstances. And let us continually offer our worship to the one who is always with us, even in the wilderness.